Well, hey, Merry Christmas, everyone. Thanks for joining with us for this second part of this series called For Unto Us. You know, something I've learned over the years of being on staff, especially in ministry at a church, is there is a basic competency, a core skill that you just, you just absolutely have to have. You might be thinking about a lot of different things, but, but really that core skill I'm thinking of is being able to introduce and execute really good icebreaker questions. I mean, because I'm oftentimes gathering a group of people and trying to get people to talk and get, get connected. And especially now in our Zoom culture with virtual meetings all the time, getting the blood flowing and getting people feeling comfortable talking to each other, it's, it's really, really important. So oftentimes I'll go to the well and I'll pull out some of the common ones, like what's your favorite ice cream and who was your favorite teacher out of all of your life and why? And, and I love to just ask, it's just kind of fun, random. If you could have a superpower, what would it be? and why, right? Just kind of fun stuff. And when Christmas rolls around, when any sort of holiday season rolls around, I like to be festive. I like to switch it up a bit and maybe ask something related to Christmas. And so what I'll often do this season is say, hey, what was the best Christmas gift you've ever received and why? I think it gets people to think and reflect. And, and not only do you have to have this core competency of asking good questions, you also have to be prepared to give an answer, right? Because sometimes people are just a little bit quiet. And so for me, when I ask that question about Christmas, I will go immediately to my senior year of college, December 2000, and the Christmas gift that I still love and celebrate and talk about to this day. You see, my, my wife now, Brooke, she was my girlfriend then, she, she gave me a couple of gifts and she put some boxes in front of me and, and we were together and she, she just knocked it out of the park, best Christmas gift ever. The way, the way she did it was phenomenal. She gave me a box and I opened it up and inside of that box was this scarf right here. And, and as, I, as I looked at this scarf, I'm thinking, I'm not a scarf guy. I was, I was a college athlete. I wore shorts and a t-shirt and maybe a hoodie every day of my life. But I opened this up and I'm like, I'm not a scarf guy. So what do I say to her so I don't offend her and act like I appreciate this thing? And again, I, I wasn't a scarf guy. And as I picked it up and I'm trying to think of what to say, there was something inside of it. And as I, I reached inside of it, I pulled out like the real gem. It was John Madden football 2001 with Eddie George on the cover. And it got me super excited because as I looked at John Madden football, I looked in the bottom corner and it was for a PlayStation 2. And I didn't yet have a PlayStation to. You see, back in the year 2000, the PlayStation 2 was the hottest item nobody could get it. It was really, really expensive. My wife, she, was, she wasn't my wife then, girlfriend, Brooke, she was already working. So she had a little bit of money, but not this much money. And, and like, I felt like she wouldn't get me the game if she didn't get me the system. So I got, I got excited and I'm holding the scarf and I'm looking at this and she hands me the next box. And as I open it up, sure enough, PlayStation 2 was there. And, and, and if I'm honest, like my eyes, they started to water a little bit in that moment. I was so excited, the hottest item. And, and like, here was the coolest thing. Yes, I was gonna be the man when I went back to college after, after Christmas break, because everybody wanted to play a PS2 and I would, I would have one now, right? But, but even more than that, like my wife, Brooke, like she's incredible. She loves to give gifts and she gave me the gift that was out of this world. And, and on top of all that, like she spent a lot of money on it. And, and even more than that, I never asked for this gift. Like she knew me. And so to this day, when I talk about the best Christmas gift that I've ever received, I talk about the PS2 and the scarf and John Madden football and, and my, my girlfriend then and now wife Brooke and how amazing she was. But, but here's the funny thing, and, and she still is, by the way. Here's the funny thing about all that. Like right now to this day, I, I couldn't tell you where on earth that PS2 actually is. I think I used it for a few years. I wanted it so badly. I used it for a few years. And eventually I think, I think we donated it. And now my best guess is that that PlayStation 2 is in a landfill somewhere. It, it's not being used. It's junk. It's trash. But, but the ironic thing is I'm now a sweater guy and a scarf guy. And I like to dress up in more than just, you know, shorts and a hoodie. And I, and I still have this scarf to this day. And I use it every winter. It's like a cherished possession of mine. You see, I realize something the more I reflect on my best Christmas gift ever. It's the fact that sometimes the thing that lasts the test of time, it's not always the thing that we most desire. So we're, we're in this series, as I mentioned, for Unto Us, and we are talking about Isaiah, the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, and the prophecy he spoke about Jesus, the coming Savior. 
It, it's a common prophecy that we read all the time. It's in our, our Christmas songs. And last week, Pastor John Riley did a phenomenal job of introducing us to this, this prophetic word that was given 700 years before Jesus was actually born that describes him in these amazing ways, these four, these four different names, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And as I mentioned last week, if you, if you didn't catch it, you, you've got to go back and, and see the kickoff of this series. John did an outstanding job of helping us understand the context of this prophecy. And then what, what wonderful counselor, Jesus as wonderful counselor, what it means. And today in our time together, I get to talk about the second name, mighty God. So when we look in the scriptures in Isaiah chapter nine, here is our anchor text. And I'm gonna start in verse number two. Here's what it says. The people talking about Israel, and, and ultimately it's talking about us, who walked in darkness, they've seen a great light. And those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light shone. Now here's, here's that passage. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Here's the names. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You see, John pointed out something amazing last week. In, in these names that are given and prophesied about Jesus that really ultimately tell us who he is, they really embody the picture of Emmanuel. See, Emmanuel is a name that we use for, for Jesus at Christmas. It means God with us. And each of these names, they are this meshing of heaven on earth. There's a divine side of the name. And then there's like a, a human earthly side. And it really portrays Jesus as God while here on earth as a man. And it gives us this amazing display of who God is and how he loves us and how he provides for us. Like Jesus as wonderful counselor. And, and today, as we talk about mighty God, it's a picture of Emmanuel. Think about it. Mighty is a, is a human word, right? It's an, it's an earthly word. It's a word we would use to describe anyone who is amazing in battle. And that's what the word that Isaiah used is describing. If you think about the Old Testament, King David, he had his mighty men. It's referring to strength and that warrior ability to conquer anything that's evil. That's the human side of, of mighty. And then there's God, right? That's the word we use for deity, for God for a supreme being with ultimate knowledge and amazing power and like God-like abilities like that don't exist for humans. And so here's Isaiah painting a picture of Jesus as mighty God. And, and if I'm honest, as I was reading this, as I was working with this, my seventh grade brain kind of kind of took over and instantly Jesus, mighty God, you know what I thought of? I thought of the ultimate warrior, I don't know if you were a wrestling fan, but for me, I grew up watching the WWF and a little bit of the WWE. And for me, I thought of like mighty God, I thought of the ultimate warrior. If you remember who he was, he was his bio describes him as hailing from parts unknown. It's like mysterious. And he, was, he would sprint into the ring. Everybody kind of sauntered down into the arena as they were being introduced, but the ultimate warrior ran in and he would circle the, the, the ring and, and his bouts were really, really fast because he was ultimate and he was strong and his face was painted in this, this amazing mass. That's, that's what I thought of as Jesus, as mighty God. I thought of the ultimate warrior. I'm just, I'm just being honest. Um, so I did a little bit of market research. I do this to make sure as, as I get older, am I, am I still a little bit relevant? I asked my son, Gino, he's in the eighth grade and he wrestles for his school. I said, gee, do you know who the ultimate warrior is? And he's like, he's like, no. I said, well, he's a wrestler. He goes, wait, is that that fake wrestling stuff? And I told him, you better watch your mouth, son don't speak that way at the WWE and WWF. We just, we had a laugh over that, but, but really he thought it was fake wrestling. He didn't know who the ultimate warrior was. And then as I was thinking about mighty God, ultimate warrior, John Riley, I've mentioned him a couple of times. He, he shot me a text. He knew what I was talking about. And he showed me this image. It's, it's, it's like Jesus as the combination of the ultimate warrior, the WWF, WWE kind of, kind of champion. It's just kind of fun. It's all, it's all in, in good humor, right? But this, this is what came to mind. And I imagine this is what came to mind for Isaiah's audience. Like this, this warrior, this strong one, this picture of, of like hope. You know, scholars would refer to this section of scripture as what's known as the messianic dawn. I love that picture. 
like in literature and, and of course in scripture, the idea of a dawn is it's signaling illumination and hope. Dawn is when the sun rises and darkness starts to get dispelled and, and good things get reawakening. It's this, this pointing of a bright future ahead. And as Isaiah was talking about Jesus, our savior, one day coming to us, a gift as mighty God, he was talking about hope for our future. And, and, and of course he talked about light that would dispel the deepest darknesses. You know, as I, as I thought even further about Jesus as mighty God, I also thought about, you know, out of the four names, this is kind of the one that felt to me like, yeah, I already knew that. And, and I'm guessing the nation of Israel, they, they maybe felt the same way too. You see, if you look back at their history, they already knew a mighty version of God. Like their story is, is amazing. God rescued them from slavery, from the largest military power, Egypt, in, in the world. God freed them. That's, that's a mighty God who does it. He parted the Red Sea so they could walk across to freedom and towards a promised land on dry ground. Mighty God fed them miraculously while they were in the wilderness and, and wandering around. Mighty God in the, in the new promised land won battle after battle on their behalf through his strength, right? And they were always outnumbered. They were always outmatched and outarmed. And so I imagine when, when they heard this idea of Jesus, Jesus as mighty God, they already had a picture of what the Savior would do for them because, because they already desired a version of a mighty God. And yet, when you look in the scriptures at Jesus, he never swung a sword. Je Jesus wasn't necessarily that ultimate warrior picture that instantly came to my mind and I imagine came to the minds of those who were hearing Isaiah. Jesus never raised an army. He never started a political revolution. No, no, no don't, don't get me wrong. Jesus wasn't weak. I mean, he was strong in so many ways. He was, he was a mighty warrior. He just maybe wasn't like the ultimate warrior version that, that often comes to mind when we hear mighty God. I think about Jesus and how strong he was because he, stroke, he spoke incredible truth to the power systems of his day. Jesus healed people miraculously. Jesus walked on water. He raised the dead. He himself conquered death and, and was crucified, but then rose again. But it just wasn't that battle warrior that, that we think of in terms of earthly and military conquests. See, to me, when, when God was gifting us mighty God, I think he was thinking more about something on the lines of this scarf than the PlayStation 2. I think he was thinking more in lines of something that we needed that would last the test of time, more so than just the picture or thing we desired. See, when I look at Jesus, I think and see that the might he displayed wasn't necessarily what everyone expected, but instead it was the might we would need for the bigger picture. Just like the scarf for me. See, as I told you, Jesus was mighty in these unexpected and, and sort of different and nuanced ways, but, but at the same time, not weak. He was, I never want to point a picture that Jesus was weak. He was strong. It was just, it was just a different version of might. Maybe might in the ways that, that we don't always think about it. Check this out. This is, this is what's, what's recorded for us in Luke chapter two about Jesus's birth. This is, this is one of the ways we get to see the might of Jesus in an unexpected way. It says this, talking about his birth, and they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph, Jesus's earthly parents, and the baby lying in a manger. Notice, notice he wasn't lying in the Hilton. Notice Jesus wasn't born in a palace. There was no mansion. There was no royal welcoming for Jesus. No, there was this manger, this food trough for animals, right? It goes on and says at the end of eight days, so eight days later, as was custom for every Israelite baby boy, Jewish boys, when he was circumcised, so Jesus was circumcised. Like talk about a humble entrance into this world. The savior, the son of God, 
sitting at the right hand, present for all of creation, the one who would rescue and redeem all of God's creation. He came into earth in this sort of manner and he was circumcised just like every other boy. Talk about humility, right? And see, to me, the way I look at that is, that was an example of mighty God being divinely strong because it takes real strength, like real inner deep strength to truly be humble. Like I think about Jesus and, and he was mighty God this way and that he chose humility when he could have desired fame. Like here comes the savior, right? He should be recognized. He should have a brand. He should have a great Twitter following and all that kind of stuff. But no, he chose humility because that's what mighty God does when he knows what we need. Jesus didn't stop with the, the strength that allowed him to, to really, truly be humble. Look at what it says here in Philippians 2. This is another version, another example of Jesus's different kind of unexpected might, not the ultimate warrior, but the mighty God we need. Philippians 2 says this, who, though he was in the form of God, this is referring to Jesus, he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, he gave, he didn't acquire he didn't take, he didn't consume, he didn't chase materialism and riches and status. He emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. This is talking about his death on the cross, right? Even death on a cross. I look at that and I think this is a different kind of strength. This is a different kind of might. It's a might that was mighty enough. And, and this is God. Like this isn't our natural human tendency. This is divine. Mighty enough to serve rather than be served. That's what scripture tells us who Jesus was. He came to serve and not to be served. I see Jesus as mighty God and that he served and what he could have desired was acquiring riches, right? But not Jesus because he was divinely mighty. He was like this God given version of strength that we don't see when we look at each other. This is the special gift. This is the savior. I don't stop there. It goes on. Luke 23 says this. And when they came to the place, this is another example in scripture of, of Jesus as a different version of my, they came to the place. This is talking about his crucifixion. That's called the skull where they crucified him. It could say they murdered him and tortured him and abused him. And the criminals, and, and this is the savior of the world, right? Who was, who was perfect, who was sinless, who healed, who, who provided miracles, who was loving, who elevated those who were marginalized, who walked on water, all that kind of stuff. And they, they put him on a cross between criminals, right? And, and Jesus, what did he say in that moment? Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And then they cast lots to divide up his garments because death was upon him. Like you talk about strength. Like to me, that's a picture of otherworldly divine strength to forgive when you were sinless. Do you ever forgive someone when they never asked for it? And, and the truth of the matter is they didn't deserve it either. That takes something different inside of you. That takes something deep. And Jesus was a deep well of the divine strength because he was mighty God. He was our savior. He was a different picture of might. The one, not necessarily that everyone desired, the one we ultimately needed. See, Jesus was mighty God and that he chose to forgive when he could have desired payback. Here's the last thing. And there's many more, if I had time, I could go in to, to a lot of different things that Jesus displayed and modeled for us in terms of a different kind of might that comes from heaven. It says this, and the people stood by again about his crucifixion and they were watching. But the rulers, the leaders of the day, the power structures, they scoffed at him saying, he saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one, if he really is this Messiah, the, the messianic dawn, then, then let him save himself. And the soldiers also mocked him coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. 
And there was this inscription they put over him. This is the king of the Jews. Then Jesus calling out with a loud voice, eventually after enduring all of the torture and never deserving it, being afflicted without any guilt upon him. He said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. See, to me, this is a picture of Romans 8, 28 in action before those words were ever even written. It's enduring pain and suffering while trusting that God is working all things together for good. No, God doesn't cause all things to happen, but God redeems and restores and works all things together for good. And Jesus placed his trust in that. And he was divinely strong to endure incredible pain. I think that we often try to use words to describe, but I don't know if we ever do it justice. Jesus was mighty God in that he endured pain when what he could have desired, the thing that we often would desire in that moment is escape. So as I think about Jesus and who he was as, as mighty God, and he was the savior. And I, and I think about uh, Jesus walked this earth, humble beginnings, all, all the things we desire in people, servant, humble beginnings, people who forgive, someone who would endure great pain and stay committed to something. Why did they kill him? Why'd they give him up? Like, like Isaiah talked about a light, the messianic dawn that would dispel their deepest darknesses. Why did they crucify him? How did they miss the Messiah? See, there, there's a lot of confusion around what was going on at that time, but, but a lot of scholars would agree is that some of the reason that they were willing to give Jesus up is because he didn't match the picture of the ultimate warrior, the mighty God that they thought they needed. You see, they thought that their biggest enemy was Rome. They thought that the nation that had conquered Israel and that was occupying them was the darkness of the land. And so what they desired was, was riches to become independent. They desired fame and endurance to be able to last as a nation. They desired the ability to just be free and established like themselves and their own. And what they wanted was military conquest, someone who would swing a sword, someone who would raise an army, someone that would culminate a political revolution and lead them to freedom. And, and Jesus wasn't that picture. How did they miss the Messiah? How do we miss the Messiah? How do we sometimes overlook how, how good and perfect Jesus as mighty God is and how much we need that version more so than the ultimate warrior version in our lives? See, here's, here's the truth. Jesus was a different picture of mighty God because he was battling a bigger darkness than Rome. He knew the bigger story. Like he saw the bigger picture. I, I often think like, how could he forgive? How, how did he endure? How, how did Jesus be so humble after coming from the right hand of the father here on earth and take on like human form? How did he do all this? The writer of Hebrews points it out and paints a picture of what that looks like. He, he writes this, the, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Here it is. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. How did Jesus display all of this mighty God characteristics? How did he do all these things that aren't natural to us? Well, yes, he was God, but he also did it for the joy set before him. Look, the joy was not that future seat at the right hand of God, this, this place of honor and this glory. Yes, Jesus is there. And yes, he does deserve that. And yes, he does get to that point. But you know what the joy set before him was? You and me. See, Jesus didn't look and, and create a definition of darkness based on earthly terms. He understood darkness in terms of eternal, forever terms. You know how Jesus went to that cross and paid that price and endured all that stuff? He did it because he loved us. And he knew that if he didn't sacrifice in that way, we couldn't have access to God. We, we wouldn't experience that relationship and that connection with our heavenly father without him as the ultimate perfect spotted lamb, spotless lamb, sacrifice. He paid it all because he saw darkness 
from an eternal perspective. So here's the question. Like, look at your life right now. I, I, don't, I don't know where you are watching this right now. You're, you're connecting digitally with, with Northway right now. And so, so wherever you are, just, just pause for a second and think and take, take some inventory. Look at your life, maybe your, your work life, your, your marriage life and your parenting, if you're, if you're a parent, where, wherever you are, like, like, what's your source of strength? What, what's your mighty God? What's the thing you're looking to, to provide rescue and hope and help when you need it, when you are weak, when you are struggling through something, what, what do you turn to, to heal you or to restore you or to be your mighty God? Is it, is it your career? Is it things? Is it a political leader? Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe, maybe your kids are your source of, of rescue. Your kids have become your mighty God. You look to them and you at least see hope there. I, I don't know. We could have a lot of different things. The choices are endless, but here's the reality. I don't know if that's the deeper question. I think the deeper question is, is what darkness do you need strength to battle? See, our understanding of darkness whether it's earthly or an eternal understanding of darkness makes all the difference in terms of who or what we choose and look to as mighty God, as rescuer, as Messiah, as savior. See, the bigger question isn't just who are you looking to right now to be your mighty God? The deeper and more enduring and more important question is, what do you understand the real darkness to be? See, our understanding of darkness it determines and shapes the source of light that we need. See, here, here's what I love so much about God and the way he provides and knows the things we desire, but loves us enough to give us what we need. God understand stood the deepest darkness that we battle. And so did Jesus. Like I think right now, when we look around at our world, we, we get a little bit confused. And oftentimes we settle for what I would say is, is more of an earthly understanding of darkness. Yes, there are dark things at work in our world. We are, we are battling against dark forces. COVID is a darkness. Like racial injustices, those are, those are darknesses. Um, loss in this life, that's, that's a darkness. Whenever we experience poverty, that's a darkness. When there's inequality that, that's not fair and not deserved and not desired in our world, when there's abuse, those are darknesses. When we, when we have relationships that break, when people don't live up to their word, when people mistreat us and abuse us, all of those things, they are darknesses. They are just not the deepest darkness. See, those are very similar to Rome. Yes, they are evil. Yes, they are bad. Yes, we do get victory through Jesus, through those things. But the deepest of all those darknesses is the eternal death that faces us if we are marked by sin. See, Jesus understood the deepest of all darknesses that we would battle, sin and eternal death. And, and the reason why, why we needed this version of mighty God is because the weapons it took to battle that were things like humility and endurance and forgiveness and this ability to serve. They were all things that add up to love. See, if you think about it, it really takes divine strength to love the way Jesus did. And it's only through love that he would sacrifice himself for us. So what's your understanding of darkness? What, what's the deepest darkness to your knowledge that we battle? See, ultimately the answer is sin and it's death. And it's ultimately separation from God who loves us. And that's what makes Jesus our savior. It's because he is a gift. He is the messianic dawn who provides hope and light and illumination and re re restoration and regeneration from that consequence of potential darkness if we believe in him, if we make him our mighty God. You know, if you think about a gift, it, it truly isn't received 
until you open it, until you take it and make it yours. Otherwise, it just stays sort of wrapped up and out there waiting to be opened. Is, is Jesus your mighty God? Is he mighty God in your marriage? Is he mighty God in your parenting? Is he mighty God in your finances? Is he mighty God in your career? Is he mighty God in your mental state, in your, your, your emotional life? Is he mighty God of your whole life? See, he died so that he could be. And the question is, is do you choose to trust him as mighty God in every area of your life? See, until we take an eternal view of darkness, we're always gonna settle for an earthly view of a mighty God. You know, all throughout this series, we're, we're, we're doing this podcast thing to provide extra resources that walk alongside us as we study these four different names of Jesus. And, and we kicked it off this week and I hope you're watching and, and tuning in and listening in. And, and, and I, I really hope that as you listen in that stuff, your, your, your ability to know, experience and follow Jesus is, it's growing and it's getting deeper and deeper and deeper. But, but as I listened to this week, I heard something that I thought, man, we need, we need to talk about this again. John Riley, as he kicked things off, he, he read a quote from theologian Carl Henry. And, and he said this, Carl Henry said this, the early church didn't say, look what the world is coming to. Instead, what they said, look what has come into the world. You see, I believe the, the key to battling the deepest darkness, sin and ultimate death, if Jesus is not our savior, if we are not ultimately in Christ, I believe the way that we battle that is we don't look and stare at the darkness. We fix our eyes on Jesus, our mighty God. And we never take them off of him. And we celebrate and we worship and we receive him as our savior. See, that's what Christmas is about. It's about calling to mind the gift of our savior. It's about being restored and renewed about the messianic dawn that Jesus is our mighty God. And he's taken care and made provision for the deepest darkness that we could ever experience in this world. So the question comes back to, have you received that gift. I've heard it said this way, that the son of man, the son of God became a son of man so that the sons of man, you and I, could become sons of God. See, Jesus, through his life and death on the cross and ultimately resurrection, made a way so that we could see him as savior and ultimately be restored so that we could spend forever in heaven with God, our father, who created and loves us. Listen, if, you, if you've never received Jesus as your savior and as your mighty God, I wanna, I wanna give us an opportunity right now for you to pray with me, for you to open that gift. And I don't ever want that to sound cheesy, but I do, I do really believe when I look at the scriptures, it's, it's not about good works. It's not about perfection. It's about faith. And it's about receiving the gift that Jesus died to give us. He was mighty God enough to do that for you and for me. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna close, I'm gonna close our time in prayer. And if you, if you have never um, received Jesus as your savior and acknowledged him as your mighty God, pray with me in this moment. And then when I'm done, when I say amen, when you close out this browser or whatever device you're listening to right now, make, make sure you respond and let us know that you made that decision so we can connect with you and walk alongside you as you've just made the greatest decision of your life. See, never forget, Jesus conquered the deepest darkness that we battle. And he was the perfect mighty God that all of us needed. The first step is receiving him as that. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus. Thank you for knowing what we needed and not just giving us what we desired. And Jesus, I thank you for the strength you displayed for being humble, for enduring, for forgiving, for serving, ultimately for loving us. And Jesus, thank you for your death on that cross, for your sacrifice 
and for being the, the, the mighty God, the ultimate warrior who conquered death and sin and the penalty that comes with those things. And so Father, right now for, for some of us, we're receiving you as mighty God, as our savior for the very first time. And so here's that prayer. If, if you're with me, pray, pray this prayer with me or something just like it. Father, I believe and I receive. Jesus, you are my savior and I confess that you're my Lord. Thank you for conquering the deepest of all darknesses. Thank you for loving me. Be the Lord of my life today. I receive you as my mighty God. And I commit today to following you. Lord, we pray all of these things in the strong and mighty and victorious and perfect name of Jesus. Amen.